In this lesson, we're going to learn about chemical equations. So the first thing is what exactly are chemical equations? Previously, we have learned that elements are represented by symbols. So if you want to find out the symbol to a particular element, all you need to do is to look at the periodic table and locate the element. All right. Then we went on to learn that different substances be it covalent, ionic, or metallic, they are represented by chemical formulas. Right in the later part of the lesson, we're going to revise how to write chemical formulas for covalent substances, for ionic compounds, and also for metals. All right. So in this lesson, what we are going to learn is what are chemical equations. Chemical equations are essentially used to represent chemical reactions or chemical processes. Now this is an example of a chemical equation. So what exactly do we look out for in a chemical equation? Now in a chemical equation, the substances found on the left side of the equation, they are known as the reactants. And the substances that are found on the right side of the equation, they are known as the products. Okay, the arrow here represents change. So what does the equation tell us? The equation tells us that the reactants, the substances that are found on the left of the equation are being transformed to products. Now the next thing that we need to look out for would be the brackets that are found to the right of the substance. Now what do these brackets represent? They are what we call the state symbols. All right? They tell us which state of matter in which the substance is found in. For example, if you look at hydrogen, there is a G, bracket G. Bracket G stands for gas. All right? And if you look at water, there is a bracket L. What does bracket L stands for? It stands for liquid, right? In some equations, you will see a bracket S, which stands for solid. And then you may also come across a bracket AQ, which stands for aqueous. Now, once again, what does aqueous mean? Aqueous means to be dissolved in water. Now the last thing that we need to look out for in a chemical equation would be the numbers in front of the substances. Now what do these numbers tell us? The numbers tell us the ratio in which the reactants react and the ratio in which the products are formed. So what do I mean by that? It means that in this particular reaction, for each oxygen, you will react with two hydrogen and it will form two water molecules. All right, so essentially the number in front of the substance tells you the ratio in which the reactants will react and the ratio in which the products will be formed. Now let us do a very quick revision of the writing of chemical formula because before we can go on to write chemical equations, we need to be able to write chemical formulas very well. So, as mentioned, different substances are represented by chemical formulas. The substances can be covalent, ionic, or metallic. We'll start with writing chemical formulas for metals. Now, is the, for metals is the easiest because the chemical formula for metals is actually equal, is actually the same as the chemical symbol. Right? So whenever we say that, for example, iron reacts with oxygen, so how do we write the chemical formula for iron? It is just the chemical symbol. All right? Another example, if we say that mm, manganese reacts with chlorine, so what is the chemical formula for manganese, we just need to look out for the symbol in the periodic table, which is Mn. 
All right, one final example where sodium reacts with water. So what's the chemical formula for sodium? It is just the chemical symbol. Now we'll look at the writing of the chemical formula for ionic compounds. Now firstly, ionic compounds are formed from um, a metal and a non-metal. Right. In order to write the chemical formula, we need to know the ion that the metal atom forms and we need to know the ion that the non-metal atom forms. All right. And we can actually know the charge on the ion by looking at the group number. All right. So for metals, group 1 metals will form ions with a plus charge, group 2, 2 plus, group 3, 3 plus. All right. For your non-metals, Group 4 atoms, uh, atoms of elements in group 4 will form an ion of 4 minus. Group 5, 3 minus. Group 6, 2 minus. And group 7, minus. Alright, so for example, if we are looking at um, magnesium and chlorine. Alright, magnesium is in group 2, chlorine is in group 7. So based on the group number, we can deduce that magnesium will form Mg2 plus and chlorine will form Cl minus. And once we have established the charge on the ions, we can go on to write the chemical formula of the compound by first writing down the number on the charge and then doing a simple cross multiplication, meaning you will have one magnesium ion and two chloride uh, ions. Alright, let's try another example. So if we have um, aluminium and oxygen. Aluminium is found in group 3, oxygen is found in group 6. So again, based on the group numbers, we will be able to deduce that aluminium will form Al3+, and oxygen will form O2-. So what is the formula of the compound? form from aluminium and oxygen it is Al2O3 now things get a little complicated when we're looking at transition elements what are transition elements if we look at the periodic table the periodic table looks like this Right, so we have group 1, group 2, group 3, and then all the way to group 0. Right, if you look at the periodic table, there are elements that are found in between group 2 and group 3. So they do not belong to any group. We call them transition elements. Right, transition elements are essentially metals. So all transition elements are metals. So sometimes we call them transition metals as well. So for transition elements, they do not fall in any particular group. So there's no way for us to derive the charge on the transition metal ion. So how then would we know um, what kind of ion it will form? Now for transition elements, when we, when we write the name of the compound, it usually appears like this. For example, we have iron 2 oxide. All right, or another example will be copper 2 chloride. So when writing the names of ionic compounds formed from transition elements, a common feature is you will see a Roman, numer num Roman numeric number in brackets. Now what does the Roman numeral tell us? It tells us the charge on your transition metal ion. All right, so what it means when you have iron 2 oxide is that it is formed from iron 2 plus ion and O2 minus. Alright, so once again when we balance out the charges you'll find that the formula for iron 2 oxide is FeO. Alright, and then when we look at the second example of copper 2 chloride. Copper 2 chloride it means that copper has a charge of 2 plus and then chloride is Cl minus. So the formula of the compound is CuCl2. 
right? Let's try one last example. Um, manganese four oxide. So when we look at the four in the bracket, what does it mean? It means that manganese, the transition metal manganese, has a charge of four plus, and and then oxide being oxygen ion will be O2 minus. So if we try to balance the charges over here, it's four and two, right? So if we reduce to the simplest ratio, we end up with MnO2. The other complicated part about writing chemical formula for ionic compounds is when you have polyatomic ions. Right, this is a list of polyatomic ions that you need to memorize. So there's no way for you to derive the formula of polyatomic ions. You just simply have to memorize it. So uh, for example, if you end up with uh, a compound that looks like this, ammonium sulfate. All right, so ammonium sulfate from the name of it you should be able to deduce that it's made up of two different polyatomic ions. And based on memory, you are supposed to recall that ammonium ion is NH4+, and sulfate ion is SO4-2-. Alright, so what is the formula of the compound form between ammonium and sulfate ion? Again, we write down the um, number on the charge, and then we do a cross multiplication. So essentially we need two units of ammonium ions paired with one unit of sulfate. Now since ammonium is a polyatomic ion, when we, uh, in order to show that we need two units of it, we need to put it in brackets. Okay, for sulfate, since we only require one unit of it, there's no need for it to be in brackets. All right, so this is the chemical formula for ammonium sulfate. Next, we'll look at the writing of chemical formula for covalent substances. Now, the very first thing that we need to recall is that certain elements all right, have atoms that tend to combine with itself. So we call them diatomic molecules. All right, how do we remember the elements that form diatomic molecules? You can use the following mnemonic, have, no, fear of ice coal beer all right so these seven elements uh, tend to have atoms that combine with itself and in the process they form diatomic molecules all right therefore whenever you see um, chemical reactions where for example hydrogen uh, reacts with oxygen Right. Um, at no time should you be writing H plus O. All right. So when you see hydrogen and oxygen, when they're talking about the elements, you are required to remember that they are diatomic molecules. All right. Same thing for the other elements shown in this list. The other thing that we need to remember when writing the chemical formula of covalent substances is that um, we can usually deduce the chemical formula from the name. All right. So some of the uh, covalent substance, covalent compounds that we learn in syllabus are like carbon dioxide, nitrogen monoxide, and let's say sulfur trioxide. Looking at the names of the covalent compounds, we can actually deduce the elements present in them. All right. And then on top of that, if you look at the name, there are certain um, prefixes, meaning words that come in front of the element um, that tells us the number of atoms of that particular element in the chemical formula. All right. So in the example of carbon dioxide, from the name of it, we should be able to deduce that it contains carbon and it contains oxygen. All right. Since there's a di in front of oxide 
and we compare it to the prefixes, it means that there are two oxygen atoms. All right. In the example of nitrogen monoxide, from the name, we can tell that it contains nitrogen and it contains oxygen. And based on the prefix of mono, it means that there's only one oxygen. And in the last example of sulfur trioxide, from the name, we can deduce that it contains sulfur and oxygen. So from the prefix tri, it means that it contains three oxygen. So what ha have we learned in this lesson is that we have learned what exactly is a chemical equation. All right, what are the things that we need to look out for in a chemical equation? And then we did, did a quick revision of the writing of chemical formula for different types of substances. We looked at the writing of chemical formula for metals, for ionic compounds, and for covalent substances.